I believe that looking at attending church and answering questions about whether it is important for us to be in church and go to church, I felt that that would be a good subject for us to look into and for us to study about. What does the scriptures say about attending church? Again, are we required to attend church? Do we have to attend church in order to be saved? Those are thoughts, those are questions that we are going to dive into in our study here this week. And we're going to use sound doctrine to, to come up with answers, to come up with knowledge and understanding of the significance and the importance of attending church. Now to do this, we are going to study scripture from the 10th chapter of the book of Hebrews. We are going to take a look there in the 10th chapter of the book of Hebrews at the 19th verse. We're going to go from the 19th through the 25th verse. That's going to be my focus scripture for this study. Now that does not mean that I'm going to go through every single verse within this passage but I do highly recommend that you, again, after we go through this study, just take a moment to go over this scripture. And as always, I am going to cross-reference scripture as well so that we can get a more rounded, uh, a rounded teaching on the scripture, on the subject here today. So we will cross-reference. I'll make sure to acknowledge when I am cross-referencing scripture so that you can follow along with me here in our study. So let us go ahead and jump right into our scripture. I'm going to read from the 19th verse down through the 25th verse. Again, you're welcome to either pause the video so that you can read it to yourself or you can follow along with me here as I read this scripture. And then we are going to go over the scripture after I'm done reading the scripture. We'll see there in the 19th verse that the scripture says there, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which we consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. The 24th verse says, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. The 25th verse, it says not forsaking the assembly of ourselves or the assembling, I should say, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now I put emphasis on the 24th and the 25th verse there because the 24th and the 25th verse, those two verses, they are going to serve as my key verses for, for our study here this week. But the writer of the book of Hebrews is pretty clear here in speaking of the assembling together. The assembling together that is being spoken of there in that scripture is talking about the assembling together of believers. And so if you, again, ask the question about church and whether or not it is important to attend church, whether or not it is important to go to church, the writer of the book of Hebrews makes it very clear again there in the 24th and the 25th verse. Let us again just repeat it, just in case you did not pick up on what the writer of the book of Hebrews said there about assembling together. Again, there in the 24th verse, the writer of the book of Hebrews said, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. So is it important to, to attend church? Absolutely. Absolutely. Again, we should not forsake assembling together. It is absolutely important for, for you to go to church. Now, some will frown and some will say, well, I don't have to go to church. And we'll, we'll dive more into that in a moment. But again, the question is, well, is it important to go to church? And 
whether or not you should go to church. And the answer to that question is, well, you shouldn't forsake assembling together. You should, as often as you can, assemble together with other sincere believers. And and I want to put emphasis on just that, sincere believers. Now, there are many who look at going to church and they look at it in a religion type of manner, with a religion type of mindset. I want to be very clear about this. There is a difference between sincere faith and religion. If you have listened to me throughout the years, if you have watched me throughout the years, if you have read my my sermons, the Sunday school lessons or the Bible studies, you know that I am big on speaking about the difference of religion and and sincere faith, because there is a difference. And many of us, we we aren't aware of that. There are many who believe that they should go to church Every single Sunday, they should not miss a church service. They believe that they should go to church every Sunday because if they are in attendance, then they will be saved. Again, this is a thought that we are going to dive deep into because is that true? Do you just have to show up to church? And if you just show up to church, does that mean you will be saved? Again, keep that in mind here. But if you pay close attention to what the writer of the book of Hebrews said here, you'll see there in the 22nd verse, I want you to highlight this in your Bible. The writer of the book of Hebrews said, let us draw near with a true heart. Now, I have spoken about this in recent weeks about the the foundation, the principles of our faith. Our faith is founded on the principle of love. That is sincere love, the love of God. We are to be compassionate in our hearts. There should be no bitterness in our hearts. There should be no maliciousness in the heart of one who is a child of God. On that note, when we move in that faith, when we move in that love, Paul, he wrote to Timothy in the first chapter of first Timothy and the fifth verse that our labor must have three points, three manifestation points, if you will. When you move in faith, you should move out of a pure heart that is an honest heart, that is a genuine heart, that is a true heart. You are to move with a pure heart. The believer should have a good conscience. The third manner in which we should move in is with that, again, sincere faith. So on that note, it is not enough for you to just simply show up to church for the sake of showing up to church. It's not enough for you to say that you are a child of God. It is not enough for you to say that you are a Christian. You have to actually be about that faith. You see, throughout scripture, we find those who were simply about verbal faith, those who like to put on a show in their faith. We see that in the 23rd chapter of Matthew's gospel. I'm not going to turn over there tonight, but write this down if you want to. The 23rd chapter of Matthew's gospel, where Jesus, he gets on the spiritual leaders in that chapter, the scribes and the Pharisees. He he spoke about how on the inside, they had dead men's bones. They had all manner of uncleanness in them. They were lawless and they were hypocrites on the inside. Jesus, in the opening of the 23rd chapter of Matthew's gospel, he literally speaks to the multitudes and the disciples who had gathered to him. And he said to them, be obedient to the law, be obedient to the commandment, be obedient to the scriptures. But The religious leaders, Jesus said to the multitudes and to the people, he said, do not do as they do. And the reason why Jesus said that was because they were hypocrites. When you think about church, okay, you should think about church in a sincere manner if you desire to go to church. When we gather together, the book, the writer of the book of Hebrews said, We should draw near to each other with a true heart. Notice 
that the writer said that we should gather together in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. It is of the utmost importance that we go to church out of sincere faith, out of a heart that is true of the full assurance of faith. We, we should not show up to church just for the sake of showing up to church. In other words, our going to church should not become mechanical. And that's one of the biggest the biggest things that I speak about as well, or, or that I, I warn people about, yes, it is absolutely good for, for you to go to church as often as you can. I go to church every Sunday, but I am there at church because I desire to be there at church. I want to be there. I want to worship. I want to be there with my brothers and sisters in Christ because I enjoy worshiping together and then I enjoy the fellowship after it. My heart, it is sprinkled from, from evil and from wickedness and from bitterness when, when I am at church. I am there for the right reasons. There are many who show up to church because they have a position in the church. They feel that they have to be there. It's not that they want to be there. They feel that they have to be there. And that's approaching very dangerous territory. We must be sincere again in our faith. We must be sincere in our attending of church as well there. Again, pay very close attention there to that 22nd verse. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, the writer of the book of Hebrews said. Now, again, focusing in there on the importance of going to church, I want to take a look again at the 24th and the 25th verse, because there's a difference. There's something that happens when you are actually in attendance at church or when you may look at service online or when when you may look at it, you know, from from your homes, of course, again, online. There's a difference. There's something that happens when we are actually together that I, I want to speak about here. And it starts there in, in that 24 verse, where again, the writer of the book of Hebrews said, let us consider one another in order to stir up love. Highlight that part, stir up love, and then highlight also to stir up good works as well. Now I want you to, to highlight that part because this is truly uh, very significant when it comes to assembling together with fellow sincere believers, with cohorts of the gospel, if you will, your brothers and your sisters in Christ. You see, this assembling together, it speaks to our fellowship with one another. And this was something that I was speaking about uh, with my brother uh, a couple of days ago as I raked the yard and he had come home and and I was talking to him and he was talking to me. My brother, he is one of those who he has a shift at work that doesn't really allow him to be able to make it to a worship service. And, and I certainly understand that there are many. There are many who will love to go to church, but they are unable to go to church for whatever that reason may be. That is certainly understandable. I want you to understand that I am not I'm not trying to get on you or anything like that. I'm just specifically focusing in on the significance, the importance of, of attending church and not forsaking assembling together. But my brother, he is one who, like some of you are able to do, my brother, he watches the sermons online. He watches the Sunday school lessons as well. Many of you you watch the videos, you watch the food for thoughts, you watch the, the shorts of, of a clip of a sermon. Uh, you, you may go over to the website and you may read the commentary of a study or, or a Sunday school lesson. It truly is good for all of, all of the ministering that I do to be available online. It's good that, that other ministers of the gospel as well, it's good that they share their work online, their ministering online as well, because some people are unable to be able to attend a worship service or Sunday school or a Bible study as well. So it is good that it is available 
for them to be able to at least watch, listen to, or to read. But when we come together, there is fellowship. And, and fellowship, it is very valuable. Fellowship between brother and brother in Christ or brother and sister in Christ or sister and sister in Christ. It is, it is truly wonderful when we are able to, to be together and we are able to worship together. My brother, he was, you know, he was following along with one of the Sunday school lessons that I had just taught recently. And I was explaining to him some thoughts that he, that he had. He was talking about how sometimes, you know, some of the Sunday school lessons may, may seem a bit repetitive, but then there's a shift in halfway through the lesson to where it really catches attention and he will, will dive in. And I explained to him, I certainly can understand where he's coming from. But the beauty of when we assemble together is I can teach to someone, I can teach to a group and, and everyone within that group, they may take in something that is differently. And we are able to discuss things amongst each other, which it is absolutely wonderful. I do this in, in my Sunday school lessons a lot to where I feel that there's a drastic difference between the Sunday school lesson and the sermon. The way that I view it is that the sermon, in my opinion, that is for encouraging. It's not necessarily a learning tool, though you can learn from a sermon. But I feel that that the sermon is for motivation and is for me to preach. It's for me to, in a manner, to get on you. It's God getting on me as well because I'm preaching to to myself as well. Whereas when it comes to the Sunday school lessons and when it comes to the Bible studies, that's where we get our meat. And my brother, he broke it down this way when, when he spoke about it. He was like, he was explaining it to me uh, with, with words that I have used before in the past where he said that the sermon is almost kind of like uh, drinking milk, like you're a baby and you drink that milk. Whereas if you want to dive deeper and you want to get a, a fuller meal, you go to the Sunday school lesson and you go to the Bible study. And when we are able to assemble together, we are able to ask questions during the Sunday school lessons and during the Bible studies, where if we are alone and we are watching a lesson or we're watching a Bible study, you can't necessarily ask me a question while following alone. You, you, you have to ask yourself the question and you have to hope that I touch on the point that you may have a question about when, when you aren't in my presence. Something that I love to do again in the Sunday school lessons when I am teaching it to the church congregation is I like for them to teach each other. I will throw out questions to the congregation and because we are assembled together again, we are able to discuss amongst each other and we are able to help each other better understand rather than it just be you by yourself listening to me teach you or preach to you or whether it be in a sermon to where you can't necessarily raise your hand up and be like, hey, pastor, pastor, if you raise your hand up while I'm preaching, I'm just going to keep on going. And I hope to get that question that you may have had after the sermon. But again, at least if we are assembled together, you can wait until after the sermon and you can come up and you can ask the questions. To me, that is the beauty of being able to assemble together, that fellowship. And, and that, again, that's something that I think we miss a lot today. And I think that that happened, in my opinion, after the year, the COVID year where during that time frame we had to worship from from our homes. And some of us we couldn't do the the streaming where we would be able to talk back and forth, you know, through through webcam and things like that. I can't recall the app name off the top of my head right now that many people were able to download and many people were able to use. I I can remember doing that time frame where I would preach to a camera or I would record a a Sunday school lesson at my computer and hope that people would watch and hope that people would listen and hope that people would read the Sunday school lesson and, 
and read the sermons. I, I truly, during that year where we did not go to church, I truly missed the gathering together to where when we were able to get back together and worship together and fellowship together, it was then that I truly realized what it was that I missed. Even, even myself, I began to realize that my going to church prior to COVID was starting to become a bit more mechanical. Whereas now I cherish each and every time we have to be able to come together and to be able to worship together. Because as the writer of the book of Hebrews said there in the 24th verse, we are able to stir each other up when we assemble together. That doesn't necessarily happen when we aren't assembled together. And again, I, I want to be very clear here. This is speaking to the significance and the importance of, of gathering together, assembling together, why we should not forsake assembling together. So every opportunity that we have to be able to gather together when you aren't so wore out that you may not be able to attend church when when being able to make it to a service actually falls within your schedule and you have the desire to be there, you should be there and you should be able to attend because attending, joining together with brothers and sisters in Christ, it, it uplifts your soul in a manner that just does not happen when you're in your homes and you're watching on TV or on your phone or on your tablet or, or at your computer. And again, to be clear, I'm not saying that it is a bad thing that, that you watch online. I am very grateful for the few of you who do support and who, who do watch the videos that I put on YouTube or, or who listens on one of the podcasting services. I am very grateful and very thankful for that. But again, I have a hope that, that you too also are able to make it out to a worship service because truly when you gather with other brothers and sisters in Christ, you, that, that, that gathering together is able to stir up what you don't realize lies within you. Again, the, the writer of the book of Hebrews said that when we assemble together, we are able to stir up love. We are able to stir up good works. We are, the writer said there in the 25th verse, we are able to exhort one another when we come together. Now, I know somebody's going to say, well, pastor, I don't have to, to physically be in the presence of someone. I can just pick up my phone. And I can make a phone call and I can talk to someone. I can talk to my brother or sister in Christ. I can, I can talk to the deacon. You know, some of us will be smart. We'll say, well, I follow you online. So I can just send you a direct message and you can answer my questions right there. But again, like I said, it truly is different when we are face to face, that, that face to face fellowship it just hits differently. And I'm telling you, you can take that from me, the one who may be more introverted than, than anyone. I'm not an extroverted person, but I truly do love being able to come together with others who are of sincere faith. And I, I'm truly thankful for when we can come together and we can communicate with each other about the things that we go through. Because you and I, as believers, we face some things in life that those who are not of faith, we face some things that they do not face. We, we face some trials and some tribulations that we can come together and that we can speak about. And then you can help uplift me. That again is the beauty of personal fellowship with one another, which we're going to dive into here again as the writer of the book of Hebrews said there again, significant and very important. I want to touch on some other scripture here in a moment, but I do want to reiterate the point that it is truly significant, significant and special when we are able to assemble together because we are able to stir up love in each other. We are able to stir up good works in each other. We are able to exhort one another as well. Now, I want you to notice there in that 24, the 25th verse there, what a writer said, we are able to exhort one another so much the more as we see the day approaching. So what is that day that the writer of the book of Hebrews is speaking of there? What do you think? What do you think the day approaching 
What do you think that is that the writer of the book of Hebrews is saying there? We, we, had, we had this before in a Sunday school lesson just recently from the fifth chapter of the book of Amos, where in that Sunday school lesson, we saw where the Lord, once again, he had a rebuke for Israel, a rebuke that actually turned into a warning where the prophet, the Lord through the prophet spoke about a certain day. So we have the day approaching there mentioned here in the 10th chapter of Hebrews and the 25th verse. Oftentimes when we think about the day approaching, we often think of the day of the Lord, right? And many of us, when we think about the day of the Lord, a lot of people think about God coming to the world, which speaks to the second coming of Christ. Now there are, I would tell you, there are a few days that, that you may have in mind here. Again, you may think of God coming to the world. That's the second coming of Christ. Now, I want to be very specific about the second coming of Christ. The second coming of Christ is not the Lord coming in and calling out the church, getting the church. That's, that's the rapture. That is a, a totally different day. Many of us, we equate uh, the second coming of Christ with the rapture when they are two separate things. At the rapture, Christ, he will come, but he will not set foot in the world. He's going to come with the shout, the voice of the archangel, as scripture tells us, and he's going to call out his church from this world. We are told in scripture that the dead in Christ will rise first. Those who are alive and in Christ, they will put off this mortal body and they will be transformed in the twinkling of an eye. So they're going to die in an instant. They're not going to necessarily taste death. They're going to put on their incorruptible, their body of their glorious body, I should say. And we are all going to join Christ in the air. And we will be with him from that point. All of us who are of sincere faith, all of us who are of the collective church of genuine believers, we will be with Christ from that point on into eternity. So that's one day that could be in mind, right? The day uh, approaching, right? The, again, the second one that, that can be in mind is the one that I've already mentioned, right? Where we could have in mind the second coming of Christ. The second coming of Christ, as we have seen in recent Sunday school lessons, and I've talked about this in both Bible studies and sermons as well, the second coming of Christ deals with the millennial kingdom where Christ is going to set foot on this world and he's going to reign in this world for a thousand years. That is the millennial kingdom. That's the second coming of Christ. The bride of Christ, those who are of the church, we are going to be with Christ at that point in time. The tribulation saints, they will have part in the millennial kingdom. Again, I've gone over this before. If you want to dive deeper into that, you can certainly find that on the website. I have video of that as well on YouTube, and you can find audio of it on your favorite podcast and service. I'm not going to use this study to dive deep uh, into, into the millennial kingdom. I'm not going to use this study to dive deep into the second coming of Christ. The day of approaching, some of us, we may think of Armageddon, right? We may think of, of God's final judgment. That is the day of the Lord which is spoken of in the fifth chapter of Amos. That's what the Sunday school lesson was about. We know that the day of the Lord, and again, I'm not going to dive too deep into this. You can go back to the Sunday school lesson if you want more knowledge specifically on the subject of the day of the Lord, so far as it being him giving his final judgment of sin and casting the sinner away from his presence for eternity. So there are three options here as to what the day approaching could be. Now, the option that I want you to understand that this is being that is being spoken of here, we, we can rule out uh, the day of the Lord, that final judgment of sin. The final judgment of sin, the believer will have no part in, because like I said, we are going to be raptured out of the world at the final judgment. We will have already received our crown. We will have already stood before the judgment seat of Christ and our works would have already come under the fire of Christ's judgment. And all of us who go before the judgment seat of Christ, yes, we are going to be judged, but our salvation, it has been sealed. So 
that final judgment is not for us. The final judgment is reserved solely for the sinner. The sinner will go before the great white throne. They will be shown no mercy. God will cast them away from his presence for eternity. Again, we can rule out the second coming of Christ being the day approaching as well. Because again, at the second coming of Christ, we are already going to be with Christ. So with the second coming of Christ eliminated and with the final judgment, the great white throne, Armageddon, with all of that being ruled out as well, the day approaching, that speaks of the rapture of the church. Scripture tells us all the time that we should be watching and waiting. And so with that in mind, the church, the role of the church, and I'm not going to dive too deep into this yet. I have a series of sermons coming up that's going to focus in on that. But I will say this, the role of the church is to build up. The role of the church is to introduce people to Christ to the way of Christ. The role of the church is to put Christ's message of repentance into the world. We are to offer and rebuke to the sinner so that they know what is right and what is wrong, so that they know what is error and what it is that pleases the Lord, so that they know that they should turn away from sin and turn to living by the word of God. That is the role of the church. We are to let people know the divine truth. Again, this speaks to the significance and the importance of, of assembling together. How many of us know the difference between, again, the rapture, the second coming of Christ, and then God's final judgment? How many of us know the difference there? I mean, you may know that difference now, but it is good for us to be able to assemble together so that we can have these, these discussions. As the writer of the book of Hebrews said, it's time for us to leave the, the, the pure milk of, of the word of God. And it's time for us to look for the meat. It's time for us to mature. It's time for us to grow in our faith. It is best for us to do that when we assemble together. And when we are able to, again, exhort one another, when we are able to stir up each other in love and in good works. Now, this is a, something that the writer of the book of Hebrews, he's not, this person isn't the only one that speaks about this. Of course, Jesus talked about this as well. Let us remember, Jesus said where two or three are gathered together, that he's there present in the midst. Does that mean that Jesus is not with, is not with us when we are alone? Absolutely not. But again, but again like I said, it is truly wonderful when we can be together and when we can worship together and be able to fellowship together. Because again, when we are able to fellowship together, we are able to uplift our spirits to heights that we just couldn't do if we are alone. Because again, when we are together, we are to edify each other. Now, this is something that Paul said in his writing. What I want to do here. I want us to turn over to some of Paul's writing here. I want us to turn over to the 12th chapter of first Corinthians. And as we turn over there to the 12th chapter of first Corinthians, let us take a look when you get there, let us take a look at the fourth through the 11th verse. And this is just a cross reference here to give us again, more foundation on what it is that we're studying about coming together, the significance of our fellowship with each other. Again, that's the 12th chapter. I turned over to the fourth chapter. That's the 12th chapter of first Corinthians. And again, we're going to take a look at the fourth through the 11th verse. I'm going to briefly touch on some of these verses. If you want to certainly pause the audio, the video so that you can, read the, this passage of scripture in full. If you so desire, I certainly would recommend it. We'll see there in the fourth verse that Paul here speaking to those of Corinth, he's speaking about the diversities of gifts. We see there in the fourth verse, he said that there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. He said there in the fifth verse, he said there are differences of ministries, but again, the same Lord. He said there in the sixth verse, 
there are diversities of activities, but again, it is the same guy who works all in all. All of us, we are unique individuals. God has given all of us different gifts that it is best that we come together so that we can use those gifts. God has not giving you a gift for you to be by yourself, for you to just sit down on your gift. You have something I want you to understand today. You have something that you can share with the world and you have something that you can share with your brothers and your sisters in Christ, which again is why it is valuable and important for us to be able to come together because what it is that God has blessed us with as a gift, it can again stir us up. It can exhort it can encourage us. And we'll see Paul. He says this there. He says that in the seventh verse, he said there in the seventh verse in the 12th chapter of first Corinthians, but the manifestation of the spirit, the spirit is what gives us our gifts. If, if we look at the day of Pentecost, and I'm sorry to break that verse off real quick, but the spirit, the Holy spirit delivers the gifts to us. The Holy spirit, you see this on the day of Pentecost with the disciples, when they receive the Holy Spirit, they receive gifts from the Lord. So that's what Paul is saying there in the seventh verse. But again, Paul said there, said the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one, listen to this, for the profit of all. That's the point of the gifts. And this is why the Lord blesses us so with those gifts, so that we can come together, so that we can assemble together so that we can again stir each other up with the gift that the Lord has blessed us with. Paul, he goes over this. Again, if you take a look at the, and I'm not going to go over these verses here, but if you take a look at the eighth through the, the 10th verse there, Paul, he goes over the unique gifts that we have. And just to sum it up for an example, I have been blessed with the gift, yes, of being able to teach and, and being able to preach. I've been blessed with the gift of being able to dive into scripture and to, to have a deep love for diving into scripture and, and seeking wisdom, knowledge, and, and gaining understanding of the word of God so that I can then express that gift that God has given to me and being able to minister the word of God with all of those who are around me. Like I said, I'm not at nowhere near as extroverted as my dad was. I haven't gotten to the point my, my dad could go out and he could speak to anybody about God, just go up to someone and just flat out talk to them. I'm a lot more hesitant in doing that. If you approach me and you have a question about the word of God, then yeah, I'm definitely going to open up to you and I'm going to share I'm going to speak to you, but I'm a lot more standoffish in my being introverted and just going up to people. And, and I would say that part of that actually comes from the lack of fellowship that we have as a community to where we have to, in a manner of speaking, be a bit hesitant because we worry about who someone may be. We don't know uh, the soul that may be residing in someone. So a lot of times we we find ourselves, or at least I do, find myself being a bit hesitant in, in who I approach. But thankfully, the Lord has, I guess, given me an aura, if you will, to where I seem approachable, at least to some people who will come to me and they will have questions. I, I say this all the time, and people don't believe me when I say this, but people are able to tell who you are who you are in your soul, it emanates from you. And people have a good sense. They're able to pick up on that. And a lot of people, for whatever reason, they have always been able to tell again, they're able to know that I'm a man of God and they'll come and they'll ask questions and I'm able to put my gift to use. Some of us, we have that. Some of us have the gift of being extroverted to where we, like my dad, we'll be able to go out and we'll just be able to talk to anybody. Some of us, we have been blessed with the gift of song. I'm not blessed with that gift. Can I sing a song? I can sing a tune. I played in the band, so I have a sense and an idea for, for being able to be in tune. And I can read music still. I ain't the, the greatest sight reader in the world as I once believed I could have been back when I was in high school. But I can still read music and I can sing a song, but that's not my gift. And I know that but there are many who have the gift of song and 
they can be there in the church and they can uplift hearts in a manner of speaking that I'm unable to do. And the same goes for me, vice versa, right? To where I can uplift through sermon and through a Sunday school lesson in a manner of speaking that the person who's been, who has that gift of song is unable to do. That is why we come together because we are able to work together for the profit of all. You know, some are, have a gift of service. And so they become a deacon. They become an, an usher because they don't mind using that gift of being able to serve. This again is why it is that we come together. You know, I'm naming a few of the roles within the church, but I believe God has given us gifts that aren't tied down to a role as well, which is why it is good that when our worship service is over, that we are able to fellowship together. And once again, we are able to encourage, we are able to exhort, we are able to listen to each other. Some of us have the gift of just being an ear for someone to vent to and, and to talk to. That's not me. I can do it in, in, at, at moments in time, but I don't have a thirst for that. Okay. But some, again, they have, are blessed with those gifts. And this, again, it speaks to the value of, of fellowship, of that coming together that I believe personally today is, again, lacking in the community and also starting to fade away from the church, which is why I believe that it is so important and so valuable that we do not forsake assembling together. There is a closeness that I feel is lacking in the world today and even in the church today. It's not like how it was when I was a little boy. Things are so much different from, from when I was in church in the 90s. I was raised in the church. I was raised in the church. My dad always had me and my brother. We were always in church. And, and I had a thirst when I was a kid of just being in church. I enjoyed church because I enjoyed listening to the songs Yes, I did go to sleep when, when Reverend Taylor stood up to preach. I was little. I, I will make that excuse, right? But over time, I began to grow and I began to listen to those sermons. And those sermons, they began to encourage me. And then over time, I began to enjoy going to Bible study. And I would throw my hands up in the air and have questions because I began to enjoy learning and understanding growing in my knowledge of the Lord to the point to where I am today, where again, I just have a thirst, a hunger for growing in my knowledge, my wisdom and my understanding. And like I said, it is good when we are able to come together because as that is my gift, I imagine that some of us, we have that gift of, of where we want to sing this song or we may want to prepare a meal for the church, you know, we work on, as my brother would say, we work on our craft and, and we want to express that craft. And so it is good when we can come together, when we can assemble together as believers to express that gift that God has given to us. Because when we express the gift that God has given to us, it profits all of us. It, in other words, it uplifts us in our soul. And that is truly an absolutely wonderful and a beautiful thing there. I want to reference here one more scripture here that, again, it speaks to the value of, of fellowship. That scripture comes from the 27th chapter of Proverbs. Let's turn over to the 27th chapter of Proverbs quickly here. Again, focusing in on the significance, the value, the importance of of going to church there in the 27th chapter of Proverbs. I want us to take a look at what it is said there in the 17th verse. That's again, the 27th chapter of the book of Proverbs and the 17th verse. I hope that you have turned there with me. If you have your phones, you should have certainly already gotten there. Now we'll see there in that 17th verse, a very familiar proverb, a proverb which states, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. So yes, that, that verse, it certainly speaks to friendship, right? But friendship is a relationship that's fellowship as well. And again, 
I truly do believe that it is good that that we can come to church and that we can make friends, sincere friends, establish relationships and fellowship within the church. It is good to have a brother or a sister in Christ that will keep you in check, that will hold you accountable, that when you err, will call you out on your errors. And again, when you need a word of encouragement, it is good that you have someone in your life that is on the same wavelength of of faith that will encourage you with a good word from the Lord, that will encourage you to continue to grow and to mature in your faith. As again, the Proverbs said, iron sharpens iron. We as brothers and sisters in Christ, we should hold each other accountable. When, when our thoughts, uh, when our actions, I should say, betray the word of God, it is good for someone to take you aside and say, hey, brother, or hey, sister. You know, it, it is good that that happens. I want to re- reference uh, the fourth chapter of Ecclesiastes here. And then I promise you, after this, we, we are nearing the end point here, uh, the significance of attending church. We'll see in the fourth chapter of Ecclesiastes, there in the uh, ninth and in the 10th verse, where we're told there in scripture, two are better than one. Now, again, you know, some of us, we are unable to to make it to service. And again, I certainly understand that. But again, it is good for us to have fellowship with one another. So when you have the opportunity to, to assemble together, it is certainly good for you to be there. Said so two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. And the 10th verse says, for if they fall, one will lift up his companion, but woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him. Again, very valuable, very, very rich word there, which again speaks to why I believe it is so important for us to, to assemble together to, to make it out to a church service when we have the ability and the opportunity to do so. Because like I said in the example that I use with, with my teaching of Sunday school, I love when, when my mom and my auntie, when, when they with the others are, are able to talk to each other and, and help each other through a, qu- a question that I have asked the church. When I teach a Sunday school lesson, I'm not going to always give the answers when, when you are in my presence. I'm going to, to make you work for that answer because I believe that that is the best way that we can come to know and to understand our faith. A lot of times we get around and we profess some things about our faith. We, we say some things about our faith, but it is good when we can come together and we can have spiritual discussions What do you suppose occurred in the early church? If you go over to the book of Acts, you'll see that that was what the early church was all about. It wasn't necessarily about the sermon. It was about the coming together and and having spiritual discussions. And again, as I said, I believe that that is something that is sincerely and truly missing today where we don't assemble together enough. There are many who are of my generation that are disappearing from the church. And when we lose that fellowship, we lose that fellowship beyond the church wall as well, believe it or not, to where many people are afraid to to talk to one another, which is why we see a society in the shape that it is in today, where there is a lack of trust. The reason why there is a lack of trust is because there is a lack of fellowship, a lack of coming together. You see, where there is fellowship, there is understanding, there is growth, there is communication, which again speaks to the significance of the assembling together of the brother and sister in Christ. Because as scripture says, we are or should be on one accord, having a sound mind on the sound doctrine. But because there's a lack of fellowship together, there are so many different doctrines that's out there. And the only thing that that creates is confusion, which isn't helpful for those who are beyond the church walls that actually desire to hear a word. There are so many today 
who are confused when it comes to God, because what is coming from those who love to profess they are of faith may not be one in the same. Yes, we all have different walks of life, but again, there is one spirit and one God. Our message on the Lord should all actually be the same. We should have a message of repentance, living in repentance. But that's a topic for another day. This was all about attending church, the significance, the importance of attending church. What is significant and important about attending church is the fellowship. Okay. That is what is significant. That is what is important. That is what is most valuable about attending church. And I hope that I answered that question right off the bat about whether or not you're attending church, whether or not that will make you or lead to you being saved or, or not saved. Going to church does not mean that you will be saved. That's just religion talking right there. Jesus, he said in the third chapter of John's gospel and the 16th verse, he said that if you have faith, you will not perish, but have everlasting life. He didn't say anything about going to church. Jesus has always said, just simply have faith. He even said, have faith, the grain of the, of, of the mustard seed. We must have faith. Faith is what leads to one having everlasting life, not getting up and going to church. A lot of people, like I said, they've become mechanical in that. And they believe that they are actually going to be saved just because they went to church and, and because they went to Bible study. Nope, that's not the case. You, you must actually have sincere faith. Like I said, you must have you must have faith and you must move out of a pure heart with a good conscience. And again, you must have sincere faith dwelling in you. It's not enough for you just to go to church for the sake of going to church. We go to church or we should go to church. We should assemble together for the fellowship, the ability to worship together, the ability to learn together and to be encouraged together to use the gifts that God has given to us to exhort, to stir up each other in love and in good works. That's where the value lies in going to church, the fellowship. So keep that in mind. As often as you can fellowship with another brother and sister in Christ by assembling together, do it. Does that have to be in the church building? No, it doesn't have to be in the church building. Just assemble together with other brothers and sisters in Christ so that you can have those spiritual discussions and so that you can, you can again stir each other up in the sound doctrine, in the word of God and in the love of God. Okay. All right. I hope I haven't rambled on too much uh, for you. I hope that you indeed enjoyed this study. I hope that this study did something for you. And I hope that it does put it in your mind that if you haven't been to a worship service in quite some time, I hope that it puts it you in the frame of mind that you have a desire to attend church so that you can be truly encouraged and uplifted in your soul to a, a different and unique level than if you were to merely watch me on YouTube or listen to me at newfoundfaith.org. So again, I hope that you enjoyed this study. I hope that you will share this study some, with somebody somewhere. And I hope that you'll come back for our study next week. If you haven't done so already, make sure that you're following here on YouTube so that you don't miss a Bible study, so that you don't miss a sermon, Sunday school lesson, or a food for thought. Take a moment, follow today.